Welcome everybody. I'm glad you found your way. Uh, although it's nice weather and it's actually nice weather to sit outside on the terrace. Of course, it's also very nice to be inside for this interesting lecture tonight. The Schumann Lecture 2030. Um, welcome for this joint lecture of the Maastricht University and the city of Maastricht. Before we start, I'd like you to, I, I want to ask you to check if your phone is out or on silent, please. So there's no disturbance during the lecture. And to introduce our uh, special guest of tonight, Professor Andreas Wirchin, uh, welcome. Um, I'd like to give the word to our uh, uh, elderman of the city of Maastricht on culture, also uh, the de deputy mayor of Maastricht, Jacques Kostos. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 19th Schumann Lecture. This is an annual scholarly event organized by Studium Generale of Maastricht University in collaboration with the municipality of Maastricht. The Schumann Lecture is named after the former French Foreign Minister and Prime Minister Robert Schumann, born in Luxembourg, I know, but in France, he was the minister. After the Second World War, he was a strong advocate of reconciliation between France and Germany. As such, he was one of the founders of Europe. Moreover, he was a driving force behind the setting up of the European coal and steel community. Today, the 6th of May, 2013, that may seem part of history, but Robert Schumann's legacy is still very evident in Maastricht, and perhaps now more than ever. Because of the fact that the city of Maastricht and the Maastricht University are both very inspired by the European project. I do not have to mention the 1992 treaty and the launching of the Euro. I can still hear the applause of the people in Maastricht while the launching of the, the, the euro was in the marketplace. Although there is a rumor going around that there are some discussions about the euro. Um, perhaps Professor Wirsching can tell us whether or not this is true. The subject to be dealt with by our speaker this evening is perfectly in line with contemporary developments in the Mersheim region. Last week, the province, the university, and the universities of applied science presented their vision for the next 10 years. A central feature of this vision, vision is the knowledge axis. An axis, a line, or a connection that can be drawn between Eindhoven in the north and descending via Venlo to Sittard Geleen, Heer and Maastricht, and also connected to Aachen and Leuven. The collaborative approach in this knowledge axis is characterized not only by knowledge development, but also by knowledge sharing and knowledge accessibility. This the issue is not only becoming a smart region, but also being able to generate knowledge and converting it into euros and jobs. This evening we will hear whether we were right to develop and detail this strategy. Is obtaining and sharing knowledge an opportunity for economic advancement? Are we in line with the European philosophy? Many of these ideas started with the Lissabon Agenda. We welcomed this agenda here in Maastricht, but we agree with the criticism of Professor Wirschin about almost utopian and, as he says, the long the of the European economic and political elite. 
So we are very interested in what this comment is on this. But it's not only that we are interested in the economic analysis of Professor Wirschi. In his book, Der Preis der Freiheit, he analyzes also the cultural domain. Identity, diversity, populism, nationalism are key words, words in this book. As you might know, Maastricht and the new region, that's Liège, Hasselt, Tongere, Kent, Aachen, Kreisache, Zittertgeleen, Heerle, the Deutschsprachische Gemeinschaft Belgiens, they are all candidates for the European Capital of Culture in 2018. The title of our big book is Europe Revisited. This region wants to be a dynamic cultural laboratory as a model for Europe. We think that the European Union is a success story. A success story for peace, for freedom and democracy, and a prerequisite for Europe's ability to compete in a globalized world economy. The 1992 Maastricht Treaty has made a significant contribution to this success. However, at this very moment, Europe is in a deep crisis, and Maastricht feels a bit and a big, perhaps, responsibility to this situation because of the Maastricht Treaty. In 2018, the Maastricht Treaty will be enforced for 25 years. Both Europe and our new region are now at a turning point in our development. We will, by the means of culture and cultural capital, try to inspire people for the European project. We are in the middle of the contest with two other Dutch cities in order to become capital of culture in 2018. Of course, the jury has to choose Maastricht. We've managed the first round with our bid book. Within a few weeks, we will finish our second bid book. When I look at it in this way, the 2013 Schumann lecture is exactly on time. I will tell you a little secret. One of the books which has been very inspiring for us was the Preis der Freiheit for Professor Wirschi. So when you did not yet have the opportunity to read the book, then buy it, read it, learn it by heart, because every student of the Maastricht University and even at every citizen of our new region should take the risk, should take the risk to get inspired by the European project again, in spite of the populist anti-European mood. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, the speaker for the 2013, 2013 Schumann lecture is the right man in these times of change to give us an extra insight into the direction we are taking. Let me further introduce this evening's speaker. He is full professor of modern and contemporary history at the Ludwig Maximilian University. He is the head of the New York Institute for Contemporary History and the author of various books, including the one I mentioned, The Preis der Freiheit, Geschichte Europas in unsere Zeit. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome Professor Andreas Kirsch. Mr. Eldonen, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And I thank the University and the city of Maastricht very much uh, for having invited me to give uh, this year's uh, Schumann lecture. I was all the more happy to accept this invitation because, in my opinion, it's important, even urgent, to talk about Europe, to discuss Europe in a time when things are difficult and when we do not know yet which sort of difficulties we are going to encounter. In times of such a crisis we are currently witnessing, it's all the more important to keep in mind what are the cultural, political and economic 
foundations of Europe, even though there is, of course, a continuous historical change of these foundations. And that brings me already to the first point of my lecture, in which I would like to stress some essentials, at least, that make our contemporary Europe so different from what it was 40 years ago. Politically, not only half the continent was in the grip of communism, large parts of southern Europe, too, were not democracies, but remained authoritarian regimes, like Franco, Spain, Salazar's Portugal, Papadopoulos, Greece. The standard of living there was low, and the agrarian sector still dominated the economy. On the other hand, countries like West Germany, the United Kingdom, Belgium and the Netherlands, large parts of France, of Italy and Scandinavia were fully-fledged industrial societies, with up to 50% of the workforce employed in the industrial sector. Coal was a still fairly important source of energy, even though the irreversible decline of the mining industry had already become obvious. Oil was cheap and abundant, although the first oil crisis in 1973 temporarily caused a sharp rise in prices and gave a certain indication of the fact that the oil reserves were not infinite. The Europe of, of the 1970s was still separated by many frontiers and it was not so easy to travel from one country to another. We do not, know to, we do not need to speak in that context about the Iron Curtain that continued to cut through the heart of Europe and prohibited the freedom of movement there in the eastern part of the continent. But also within Western Europe, border controls were normal and often time-consuming, even though compulsory visas had been abolished by the end of the 1950s. It was still difficult to move from one country, European country to another in order to settle down, to work or to study abroad. Many requirements and qualifications had to be met by applicants and bureaucratic proceedings were complex and sometimes insurmountable. I don't know if today there are also complex bureaucratic proceedings, but uh, in my opinion, or as far as I can see, they are normally they are surmountable. Finally, travel was expensive, and as far as air traffic is concerned, often a luxury. Computers did exist in the 1970s, but they were huge machines working in closed laboratories and being run by specialists. And computers did not affect everyday life at all. Even secretaries still used rather old-fashioned typewriters to, when writing their boss's letters. It would be easy to extend this list of differences between the Europe in the 1970s and today. But instead, I would like to direct your attention to what seems to me perhaps the most important underlying change. And that is the change in economic structure and the accompanying changes in the working world. In this respect, the 1980s were crucial, were a crucial period, not only for the western part of Europe, but also for its eastern countries and their eroding communist regimes. This is the decade when traditional and familiar forms of the economy and the workplace began to enter their irreversible and partly fatal crisis. In Great Britain, the miners and printers who had once been the spearhead of uh, trade union power fought their last battles for their workplaces against the Thatcher government and against people like Robert Maxwell the famous British press tsar and ruthless modernizer of the print industry. But this was a futile battle. The acceleration of technological, technological change, the economic slump and growing international competition interacted to end the last big fight of British trade unions in a big defeat. 
In 1989, less than 5,000 5, miners went to work in South Wales, where 250,000 pitmen had once earned their living. In a like manner, the Western European textile industry collapsed. During the 1980s, the last big textile, textile plants were closed down, while at the same time, steel workers in Germany and elsewhere fought for the very existence of their factories. These examples could easily be extended. With a great vehemence, the international market forces continued their relentless drive, and this vehemence could not be changed by any instrument of economic or social policy. Even in West Germany, where industrial corporations were rather quick to adapt themselves to the new conditions by means of rationalization and innovation, more than two million industrial jobs were lost between 1978 and 1984. Several developments, whose origins dated back to at least a decade ago, converged in a difficult situation in 1980. The sharp rise in oil prices in 1973 and again in 1979 had left its mark on the world economy. In all Western industrial states, measures of rationalization and the cutback of industrial jobs were the consequence. Stagflation and high unemployment rates constituted a sort of crisis experience that was completely new for the post-war era. Moreover, the highly visible trend towards the internationalization of the world economy was questioning traditional securities and markets. Western Europe and the United States were facing the challenges coming from Japan and increasingly from the so-called four Asian tigers, namely Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore and Taiwan. At the same time, still in the shadow zone of world history, but with revolutionary consequences in the long term, China, under its great reformer Deng Xiaoping, embarked on the path to modernization. Thus, already in the 1980s, the profile of a new axis of globalization, ranging from North America via Europe to Northeast Asia, became visible. At the same time, the 1980s were to become acquainted with the manifold forms of new modernity. As far as media, laser and satellite and above all computer technology were concerned, nothing short of a revolution was taking place. Technological innovations paved the way for new productivity in the service sector and this began with new media and the development of a digital finance industry. This made possible a huge, albeit partial, economic dynamic and correspondingly created new chances for the future. If we look then at European history since the 1980s, we observe that the political caesura of 1989 was embedded in a huge revolutionary and global technologi technological and economic development. The new information and communication technologies, the ICTs, changed the world. An irresistible technical acceleration first caught hold of the developed countries of the West and Japan, and then since the millennium, the whole world. The personal computer changed dramatically working environments as well as everyday life and leisure habits. The World Wide Web, which was introduced in 1995, accelerated once more this development. It now became possible to transmit information and data more or less immediately and all over the world. In fact, by the beginning of the 21st century, it had become technically irrelevant if an office clerk, clerk worked in Europe, North America or in Asia. It was in this context that Western European governments and increasingly the European Commission began searching for strategies for how to overcome the crisis that had been caused by the large structural changes occurring since the, the late 1970s. 
And this brings me to my second line of thought, namely the origin and development of European concepts of how to cope with global competition as well as with its, its social and cultural consequences. <coughs> Since the mid-1980s, Western European governments have found a strategy in a combination of market liberalization, investments in new information technologies and education. Key areas of this combination were private privatization policies, the liberalization of the labor markets, and educational reforms. This was accompanied by an increasingly intensive liberalization of international trade and finance, while in Europe itself, of course, the single market was accomplished. Thus, and that is important, by no means was the globalization of the 1980s and 1990s a sort of uncontrolled process, which engulfed the Western world, as it were, like a natural disaster. On the contrary, states and governments contributed actively to it because they, they thought they could best combat economic crisis and unemployment by means of liberalization and market-oriented politics. Through liberalization, deregulation and privatization, the Western governments enhanced the power of the market and enlarged the international room for maneuver for the great international banks and multinational corporations. The underlying idea was to ac accelerate the ongoing structural change and to transform industrial societies with their large amount of manual labor to modern service societies. This calculation tied in with a long tradition of social analysis and social forecasting. Already in the 1950s, some observers, some observers had predicted the transition from industrial to post-industrial or service societies, starting with Jean Forestier's overly optimistic forecast. These studies agreed on the expectation of higher productivity, higher levels of education, the humanization of work, and a flourishing culture. In this context, Peter F. Drucker, or Drucker, the leading theorist of management, predicted as early as 1959 uh, the rise of a new class of knowledge workers, as he called them. The most influential writer in this respect was probably the American Daniel Bell, whose book on the coming of the post-industrial society was published in 1973. Bell's post-industrial society is driven by knowledge and science-based innovation. Accordingly, the new society would, without any doubt, be a knowledge society. Knowledge would be the decisive factor of innovation and transform fundamentally the nature of work and production. Bell did not conceal his assumption that this new society would probably create new requirements to adjust and new pressures to conform. But this could also be seen in an optimistic way. In an increasingly computer-based knowledge society, a new labor force would be able to meet these requirements by means of more intensive vocational training and higher levels of education. In his social forecasting, Bell predicted greater prosperity within a technologically advanced economy. Thus, he led the way in transforming late Marxist humanistic ideals into an optimistic or even utopian analysis of the future post-industrial society. He did so in an age of plenty, shortly before the first oil price crisis. Ten years later, however, at the beginning of the 1980s, the age of plenty was over and a long period of austerity had begun. The optimistic vision that Forestier, Bell and many others had been venturing has not fully come to pass. Certain, certainly in today's Western developed societies, the amount of manual labor has been reduced and the service sector has grown as predicted, but there has been no self-sustained growth 
no full employment and no significant increase in the average standard of living. One main reason for these rather disillusioning developments was of course the growing international competition in the age of globalization. Already since the 1980s, but above all during the 1990s, when multinational corporations began relocating their production to low-wage countries, pressure was mounting on Western European labor markets as well as on working conditions. Millions of industrial jobs were lost without full compensation. While the welfare state came, came under fire, Western European societies were increasingly facing tendencies towards social polarization and exclusion. And it was in this context that the concept of a European knowledge society became an integrative cross-sector strategy for mobilizing European cultural resources, modernizing the European economy and thus enhancing Europe's competitiveness in the world. Since then, the discussion of how to build a highly productive European knowledge society has never ceased. If for a moment we search for a definition of knowledge society, which is a rather loose term of course, we encounter at least four features that are dominant in the discourse. In the first place, we can identify science as an essential attribute of the concept of a modern knowledge society. In the last 40 years, science has increasingly uh, left the ivory tower and continuously extended its social functions. The neologism scientification, in German Verwissenschaftlichung, betrays the progress made by science-based knowledge and its permeation of ever more areas of social life. Second, science has of course promoted technology. There are several new technologies that have gained momentum since the 1980s. The most important are of course the ICTs, which have contributed to that sort of third industrial revolution we have been experiencing during the last 30 years. Third, the concept of the knowledge society postulates that knowledge is becoming an important productive power which is increasingly placed alongside capital and labor and may even supersede them as the decisive motor of economic productivity. And this is why, fourthly, the concept of knowledge society requires the transformation of education. Facing the ever-increasing needs of the modern knowledge-based economy, education must be developed further in a double sense. Governments and public actors have to improve the educational systems and implement the necessary changes. Individuals have to meet the challenge and to make additional and permanent efforts to enhance their knowledge and their capability to act successfully on the labor market. In the third and largest part of my lecture, I would now like to discuss the assumption that this European concept of a knowledge society has not only been very influential at a political level, but had, has also begun strongly to change and to transform the European societies since the 1990s. You may object that Europe is not a homogeneous region, and that is, that is of course correct. European realities are very different. Aggregate European data mask strong national disparities. And the process of transformation which encompasses the whole of Europe is certainly taking place at a very different pace. On the other hand, it cannot be denied that some key tendencies of what may be called the knowledge society are noticeable in all European countries. Thus, science has continuously enlarged its social functions and has permeated almost all areas of life. 
This is even true for the private sector and the private sphere. If you only think of the human body as the objective of science, the healthcare industry or the, or the many science-based solutions that are offered for almost all psychological problems and personal troubles. At the same time, technology and above all ICT has transformed the everyday life of European populations in a way that may truly be called the third industrial revolution. But the concept of knowledge society means much more than the progress of technology and science-based knowledge. It targets at the same time, and this is important, the individual. The goal of raising the competitiveness of the European economy by privatization, the liberalization of markets and the application of new technologies implies the transition to more flexible working hours and conditions. In the last 30 years, in the context of deindustrialization and the rise of modern service societies, we have been witnessing immense changes in labor markets and working conditions. To some extent, the concept of the knowledge society is to provide the ways and means for individual adjustment to that change. There has been a clear shift from collective responsibility embodied by the trade unions, for example, from collective responsibility for work and labor markets to individual responsibility. If working conditions were increasingly formed by new technologies and labor markets were made more and more flexible, the working individual would need to improve its working knowledge and its capabilities. In the knowledge society, it's the individual that is responsible for its own competitiveness on the labor market. It's the individual that has to invest in its competences and proficiencies in order to secure its employability. Consequently, the individual is also liable for any deficiencies in its employability. Thus, the ideas of lifelong learning, of job mobility and continuous flexibility on the labor market have become important hallmarks of the knowledge society. The entrepreneurial self may be regarded as the overarching ideal of that society. This concept has been described by many authors, more precisely by Peter F. Drucker, whom I quoted already, when he dealt with his ideal type of the knowledge worker. The knowledge worker is to some extent the historical successor of the white collar worker. He disposes of an advanced education and greater and great spatial and professional flexibility. He can swiftly change jobs and employers and he is able to repeatedly acquire highly specialized knowledge. All this enables him to act in complete autonomy on the labor market and to choose between many different options vis-a-vis -vis his personal career. In the end, power in the workplace, according to Drucker, will shift from bosses to knowledge workers. As Drucker himself formulated in 1999, I quote, more and more people in the workforce and most knowledge workers will have to manage themselves. They will have to place themselves where they can make the greatest contribution. They will have to learn to develop themselves. They will have to learn to stay young and mentally mentally alive during a 50-year work, 50-year working life. They will have to learn how and when to change what they do, how they do it and when they do it." Unquote. This analysis by the leading theorist of management, the Austrian-born and American-based Peter Drucker, was immensely influential. Until his death in 2005, Drucker published 39 books which have been translated into more than 30 languages. The community that was most receptive to Drucker's concepts was, of course, the consulting business. Drucker himself entered into a long and successful consulting career and worked with major corporations like General Electric, Coca-Cola 
and many others. For the mission statement of consulting firms like McKinsey, Boston Consulting and many others, Drucker's credo of self-management, individual creativity, lifelong learning and job flexibility on the market has become a sort of modernization mantra since the late 1980s. Ironically, it converged nicely with some late Marxist positions. Daniel Bell had led the way in transforming Marxist humanistic ideals into an optimistic analysis of the future post-industrial society. Others, like Adam Schaff or André Gortz, followed this path. The future society based on self-sustained self growth, prosperity and leisure would offer everyone unprecedented possibilities for individual cultural development. It was in this sense that Adam Schaff, on behalf of the Club of Rome, wrote in 1985, and I quote, the universal man is universally educated. That is why he is able to change his profession and to change his position in the social division of labor. So far, this kind of man has only been utopia, but today this man is beginning to become a reality. To some extent he is becoming a necessity. Continuous education and the ever more efficient information technologies will realize this ideal." Unquote. Now, the 1990s have been strongly characterized by the interpenetration of consulting expertise on the one hand and globalization strategies of governments on the other hand. This is particularly true for the European Union and its Commission. By the end of the 1990s, a large majority of European political actors had enthusiastically accepted the paradigm of the knowledge society. Advised by social scientists, economists and practical advocates of the concept, the European Union made the language of the Knowledge Society the basis of its program. A society based on knowledge was to enhance Europe's cultural and economic power, to secure Europe's place in the world and to ensure Europe's future. In 2000, the so-called Lisbon strategy was adopted, which aimed at making, quote, Europe by 2010 the most competitive and the most dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world." Unquote. The knowledge society that European politicians had in mind was not confined to an increased commitment to research and development. The, Re the, European, Un the European Union tied its ideas to the imperative of economic competitiveness. In this sense, <clears throat> the European Knowledge Society was to cover, and I quote, every aspect of the contemporary economy where knowledge is at the heart of value added from high-tech manufacturing and ICTs via knowledge-intensive services to the overtly creative industries such as the media and architecture. It is estimated that up to 30% of the working population will in future be working directly in the production and diffusion of knowledge in the manufacturing, service, financial and creative, creative industries. A large proportion of the rest of the workforce will need to be no less agile and knowledge-based if it is to exploit the new trends. Europe can thus build on its generally strong commitment to create a knowledge society to attain potential world leadership. This is a quote from the so-called Koch report in 2004 on behalf of the Euro European Commission. The underlying assumption here was the idea of social mobility. In fact, this came close to Peter Drucker's model of the knowledge worker. The knowledge society was, according to him, characterized by social permeability. In the Knowledge Society, Drucker wrote in 1994, for the first time in history, the possibility of leadership will be open to all. Others, like Manuel Castells, Spanish-born social scientist, a former Marxist, 
and the author of the highly influential work on the information age, predicted the rise of a network society. What is meant here is an emancipatory society that has been changed forever by new information and communication technologies. The basis, according to Castells, of such a society is the direct interaction between the net and the self, bypassing traditional seats of power like the patriarchal family and the nation state. Thus, the network structure, the network society is an open structure and in itself quite different from a society based on classes or social strata. Again, the European Commission linked in with this idea when it hailed the quote, possibilities for wider economic structures to create the network economy and society and a fundamental re-engineering of business processes by promoting ICTs. Now, if we compare this optimistic forecasting with today's realities, we will probably be disillusioned. It has often been observed this, that the exigencies of changing labor markets risk new forms of social polarization and exclusion. Those who are not capable of meeting the new requirements of flexibility, creativity and better education risk being left behind on the job market. Social scientists, therefore, were quick to refer to the growing trends of social marginalization and social inequality. They warned about a purely negative individualism that would cause a new and huge vulnerability on the market. In view of the European globalization strategies, people like Ulrich Beck, Robert Castell and others already predicted around 1990 that those new forms of market vulnerability would not be compensated for by increased investments in human capital. Increased flexibility and the fragmentation of the labor market would cause decreasing job security and insecure breadwinning options. While the European Union and the OECD hoped for more and better jobs, skeptics predicted an increase in bad jobs. Indeed, national differences in Western European countries certainly existed, but none of the European societies was able to escape the main developments. Technological change, globalization and political decisions created new risks of poverty among those who were not capable of keeping pace with the economic acceleration. Those who did not dispose of the necessary education and training to manage themselves on the labor market were left behind. This is where a, a new lower class came to in, into existence, which has become a, an objective for social scientists in the meantime, namely a sort of precariat, chronically underemployed, without hope of moving up and dependent on public welfare. In the post-communist societies of the former Warsaw Pact, this pressure to adjust was even more intensive. After the downfall of communism, the ruins of the old system were barely suitable for social protection against the risks of capitalism. On the other hand, post-communist governments largely agreed to conform to the new standards of a globalized economy by liberalizing and privatizing large parts of their econom economic and public sectors. The idea of a knowledge-based competitive economy became in this context also very attractive to governments while many former workers of the state-run industry were facing unemployment. The main instrument European politicians liked to employ to counteract these exclusive tendencies of what was called the European Knowledge Society was the reform and intensification of education. Indeed, 
education as a concomitant of market liberalization has become the key area of Europe's political efforts to meet the exigencies of globalization. Education is the quote cornerstone of human security and knowledge societies, as a UNESCO report put it in 2005. I would argue that the main cultural consequences of the concept of knowledge society can be observed in the educational discourse, the reforms of the educational system and its interplay with labor markets, which have been made or are being made more flexible. In the 1980s, the main challenge for the discourse on education came from the dynamic process of internationalization that was connected with an accelerated development of new ICTs. Parallel to these developments, a tendency to discuss new technologies of the social began to spread. Many observers and consultants coming from business and technical uh, milieus began demanding concrete educational policy measures. The challenge of the new technologies demanded new requirements for the education and training of men. If, in fact, one could not evade the technology, it seemed to be all the more necessary to adjust man himself, to modernize his habits, his capabilities, his working technique, in order to achieve a new progressive and growth-oriented man-machine system, as it was put in 1984, for example. This was, above all, a cultural and educational problem. Technological progress itself required the integration of working people into new, more flexible professional organizations. As early as 1984, political advisors were speaking of a new crisis of education. In the face of the explosive technological development, the traditional educational system had, from this point of view, definitely lost its legitimacy. In the, quote, humanely computerized society, the educational system required a complete overhaul. Appropriate education could only mean educating and qualifying people for their life in a world structured by information technology. There is probably no political sector in the history of European integration that has undergone a more significant change than education policy. At the beginning of the 1980s, the educational aims of the European community still corresponded to the mission statement of the Europe of citizens. Education was considered a complement to strengthen the European democratic conscience of the European citizens. By the end of the 1990s, however, education had become more or less completely an instrument for European globalization strategies. Education had become crucial for European competitiveness. Thus, education formed a key element of the Lisbon strategy. Europe's education and training systems, the European Council postulated in 2000, need to adapt both to the demands of the knowledge society and to the need for an improved level and quality of employment. They will have to offer learning and training opportunities tailored to target groups at different stages of their lives, young people, unemployed adults, and those in employment who are at risk of seeing their skills overtaken by rapid change. In 2002, the European Council set the objective of, quote, making European education and training systems in, in Europe a world quality reference in 2000, by, by through 2010. The high-level group of the EU, chaired by Wim Kopp, demanded in 2004, furthermore, that workers be able, quote, constantly to acquire and renew skills and be trained to make moving from job to job as easy as possible, unquote. The individual's employability on the market became the central target of education and it was in this context that the European Commission set up a highly sophisticated benchmarking system. 
National institutions of education were expected to orient their policy towards this target. From primary school to higher education, for which employability also became, became the leitmotiv in line with the Bologna process, which had been adopted in 1999. European bureaucracy aim, aimed at a strong and complete chain of, quote, reliable and responsive lifelong learning systems. Together with active labor market policies, this should help people to cope with rapid change, unemployment spells and transitions to new jobs. The fact that the underlying educational program implied a rather severe process of adjustment was to some extent softened by the promise of a new work culture. New semantic strategies placed the emphasis on individual and communicative qualities. Creativity, communication skills and the ability to work in a team became much discussed key qualifications. Again, the influence of consulting is highly visible here. The acquisition of these competences, however, was imposed more and more on individuals and education systems. Thus, the industrial society needed to be complemented by a learning society because capital as the dominant productive force was being replaced by knowledge and creativity. Seen from this perspective, the problematic aspects of the concepts of the knowledge society cannot be ignored. Undoubtedly, the concept contains a technocratic tendency, dangers of social engineering and the economization of the education system. As such, it may also appear as a sort of ideological tool invented to accelerate and to legitimize the ongoing changes and adjustments. These changes and adjustments may be necessitated by globalization, yet they are also rather useful for those businesses that profit from globalization and technological change. Behind the language of the knowledge society, we find, of course, specific interests of capital utilization. The Association of Bavarian Entrepreneurs, for example, has recently put it this way, and I quote, Universities and colleges of higher education are responsible for the employability of their students. That is why we demand from all programs of study that they enable students, students to acquire practical experience." Unquote. To put it pointedly, late Marxist thought turned utopian and the more earthly interest of shareholder capitalism and political preoccupations over how to cope with globalization colluded in the new language of knowledge society. In Europe, this discourse created a social and economic climate in which education runs the risk of turning into the token of a technocratic modernization or globalization strategy. Thus, a good deal of skepticism is called for towards today's financial industrial academic complex, to quote a term of the French historian Dominique Pestre. I will now come to the final and brief part of my lecture that is dedicated to the question, where do we stand today? In my opinion, Europe is facing several great dilemmas or predicaments which are strongly highlighted by the debate on the European Knowledge Society. These dilemma, dilemmas stem from the awareness of at least three recent developments which place a question mark over any purely optimistic vision of making Europe fit for globalization by knowledge. First question mark, the age of utopia, utopia is gone. I have underscored the utopian elements that lay at the root of the early concepts of the knowledge society. These utopian elements resulted from a convergence of late Marxist humanism as embodied by Daniel Bell, consultant ideology as presented by Peter F. Drucker, and the overly optimistic confidence in, in the socio-cultural transforming power of new ICTs, as for example prescribed by Manuel Castells. Today, we have to admit that as a general benchmark 
for the labor markets, the vision of the highly educated and well-trained sovereign of his or her professional biography has proved simply unrealistic. Instead of minimizing socio-cultural differences, the new global science-based knowledge and digital economies risk reinforcing old divisions and creating new ones. Today, the promise of progressive prosperity for all and collective well-being in the future that has always characterized the European narrative since the Second World War has apparently lost its spell. Second, this has, of course, something to do with the fact that Euro Europeans are not alone in the world. We need to stress the point that the tendencies towards what may be called knowledge societies are global. Certainly, it cannot be denied that the gap is still growing between those countries that continue to have little access to education and new ICTs and the richer regions of the world. But it's also undeniable that the spread of ICT and education has accelerated significantly since the end of the 1990s. This is at least true for the so-called BRIC countries, which are together with the OECD countries, the driving forces of globalization. And as to China, everyone would agree that here is a giant of knowledge and power in the making. Thus, any concept of European knowledge societies is part of a much larger global process in which the different world regions will have to define their place and their interest. Europe, therefore, needs to take into account its historical and cultural peculiarities when debating the ways and means of developing its own modern knowledge-based economy and culture. And these European peculiarities are indeed highly visible. They come to a large, large extent from historical experience. Europe was, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the first continent to live with the dire consequences of a fully developed industrial society and unleashed scientific progress. The results of these experiences with modernity were, to say the least, ambivalent. And that is why Europeans display a certain uneasiness with regard to the relationship between science, society and individual lives. Current examples for that are the still unsolved debates on genetically modified food, on pre-implantation diagno diagnostics, or on the issue of stem cell research. Thus, the preoccupation of European governing elites with science and innovation risks coming into conflict with a rather, rather innovation-averse European public. Technocratic visions and democratic answers might fall apart. That is all the more true for the question of social security. Compared to other world regions, Europe continues to derive a significant part of its identity from the idea of social welfare, which is to be implemented collectively. The tradition of the European welfare state has come under fire from both neoliberal policies and the idea of the entrepreneurial self that is closely connected to the concept of the knowledge society. On the other hand, there are powerful countervailing forces at work against these European traditions. No one can really doubt that there is a tough economic necessity to cope with global competition and that the danger of international investments in technology and science being transferred to other parts of the world is by no means a fantasy. In order to survive this competition, continuous technological progress, a highly trained workforce and more flexible labor markets are indeed necessary and desirable. And it is equally true that it will not be possible to progress simultaneously towards economic growth, social development, and the protection of the environment without reliance on knowledge resources, scientific research and technical expertise. Facing this dilemma, Europe should not throw away those traditions that are worth preserving. The organizational role of the democratic state, the principle of solidarity, 
a specific sense of social justice and an education system striving for the development of a free personality are crucial for these traditions. The challenge is to find a balance between the economic needs and these traditions. European governing elites need to find a middle ground in accepting and even accelerating the necessary changes and implement the concomitant reforms. The concept of a knowledge society can certainly contribute to this balance if its inherent dangers of social engineering and technocratic approaches are discerned and as far as possible prevented. The third and last dilemma I would like to mention concerns the very nature of knowledge and science. Just in recent times we have learned that science and expert knowledge do not guarantee the correct answers. Certainly the total amount of knowledge has increased exponentially during the last three or four decades and is still increasing every day. But knowledge is accumulating at a rate that is, much, that is much faster than the pace at which new information can be transformed into new concepts and theories. This is probably why there will always be an insecurity of decision in science. The Euro crisis may be the best example. The whole amount of scientific knowledge as accumulated by generations of economists and financial experts does not help to find precisely the right answer. On the contrary, politicians and experts have discovered that they have to deal with genuinely political decisions. They must be taken without the reinsurance of scientific exactitude and within a context that is determined by both global influences and inner European contradictions. I hope it has become clear that the concept of knowledge, of the knowledge society, is both highly promising and highly ambivalent. In Europe, the concept resulted more or less consistently from the dramatic global economic and technological changes occurring since the 1980s. It tied in with an important trend in social sciences and social forecasting that dated back to the 1960s. For European governments and its populations, the idea of promoting science and education not only made sense, but was indeed highly seductive. It seemed to offer the most efficient strategy to cope with the crisis of the late 1970s, to face increasing competition and to make the continent, which is so poor in natural resources, fit for the future. On the other hand, the concept of the knowledge society implies not a few dangers of technocratic rule and of polarizing society. This is all the more true if the concept of knowledge is exclusively understood in economic terms and is primarily applied in a functional way. It should hardly be possible to link knowledge, science and education only to the economy, to the labor market and to the employability of the individual. Knowledge, science and education are always linked to cultural traditions and path dependencies. <coughs> and in this, respect, <coughs> in this respect, Europe is much more than a big labor market. <coughs> it needs to draw its strength not only from economic processes and their principles, but also from the development of personality, which should not be separated from traditions of the Enlightenment moral individuality, pure research, and the pursuit of knowledge for its own ends. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring lecture and this uh, view on the developments in the recent history, if I look around this room, I see two groups, those who have been there in the 80s and those who have been born after that, our students. So we also, some of us have been there and uh, experienced that some of that is it's already history and it uh, also provides an interesting dialogue. Well, we have some time for discussion and some questions. There are some, mic there's a microphone here. Maybe I'll start with the first question. It is, um, and it's not meant to be cynical, but it's a question, 
is has Europe fulfilled its promise or is it has it been really achieving the status of, of turning a difficult time into a knowledge society and is this future proof? Because if I if I remember correctly, in the in the Lisbon uh, declaration, it was determined by the, by, the, by the year or it was promised that in the year 2010 European countries should dedicate 3% of their gross national product towards knowledge. And mm -hmm. even in the times before the current crisis, this was never achieved. And uh, very few countries in, in this day, with the exception of uh, maybe Germany or Limburg, uh, that invest still in, in knowledge, economy, and society. Of course, the current budget cuts have made uh, provided a lot of suffering to knowledge institution, knowledge bearers. I recently talked to colleagues from Greece where they are so severe budget cut in universities they can't even hire any new personnel. Mm -hmm. And uh, given that in the context also from the development of the new superpowers, the BRIC countries, China, India, Brazil, uh, that could lead easily to an exodus. So has, has Europe missed this chance of uh, being really a knowledge economy that could be a model for the world? Okay. Do you want me to answer directly? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, perhaps I uh, stand up. Um, it's um, not easy to uh, give a, the right answer to this very complex and difficult and, and uh, correct question, of course. I would say there are different dimensions. First of all, we have to distinguish between the period before the cr current crisis, which of course is hitting countries like Greece in a terrible way, so that they are not, uh, by far, not uh, capable anymore to, to, um, to invest uh, uh, enough into, into research and development and universities. So we have to distinguish between the period before the crisis and, and the current period within the crisis. And uh, in the current period, we are, of course, uh, facing enormous um, enormous financial difficulties in many countries in Europe, which uh, prohibit uh, the, the, the uh, necessary policies, the research and education policies, which, are, uh, which would be necessary. But uh, the question is, in my opinion, historically more important as to the, the, uh, the former period. And um, there I would say um, that certainly Europe had, has made a, a, some effort, a big effort even, to cope with these benchmarks, with these ideas of uh, enhancing the, the power and the, the capacity of, of education and research and development. Uh, but they um, didn't do enough. That is certainly the case, the 3% th the of the um, uh, gross product uh, has never attained, has never been attained. Even in Germany, I think it hasn't been yet attained. Um, and um, what is probably even worse, in my opinion, is this linkage to a functional approach to education, which I was trying to describe. A functional approach which um, has a sort of even a little bit sterile uh, idea of the economic utilization, the direct economic utilization of education. And this, of course, has, has uh, had some dire consequences in many universities uh, as to uh, those uh, subjects uh, which are not so uh, well marketized, which are not so useful on the market, and has uh, damaged, in my opinion, the whole university and the whole educational fabric um, so uh, the functionalism, the economic functionalism of education policy is, in my opinion, the, the at least as large a problem as the underfinance uh, financement of of uh, education of the education, which is indeed a serious problem compared, at least, uh, to to different regions of the world. The United States, uh, also before the crisis. Um, uh, on, on the first place, but also the rising states like, like Brazil, Brazil which, which is doing immense efforts uh, for its education system and university system. This is absolutely right. So I, I see it more critical in terms of volume of uh, finan financing, uh, but also in terms of this uh, prevailing functionalism uh, for, for this uh, for this, well, if you like, knowledge society defined in terms of 
of uh, market policy, if so to speak. Thank you very much. Further questions? Yes, there's a lady in the back here, and the microphone, wait for the microphone, otherwise it's very difficult to hear in this room. Um, I basically have two questions. Um, my first question would be about an issue which is often also quite discussed by scholars in the recent years, mainly the limitations of knowledge. The current problems we basically face in society where um, diseases, psychological problems which result from the pressure on this knowledge society um, have been recognized much more. So what are your um, ideas and opinions about these limitations of knowledge that we basically see in society? And as a second aspect, you've mentioned a lot um, the individuals who have to do a lot to basically bring their knowledge to the maximum degree, um, who have to find their way. And we've also discussed about the role of the European Union. But um, since we're in the context also of the university here, what do you think are the major um, steps that university institutions have to take? So besides the individuals and the European Union, um, and the member states, what actions do institutions like the universities, but also other companies have to provide in order to really realize the plans and these ideals of a knowledge society? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, first question, the limitations to knowledge and uh, diseases, as you put it, even uh, created by this pressure of uh, modern uh, societies on the labor market and so on. I'm not an expert in that, uh, in that field, but uh, in general I would say it's the logic outcome of a new technology, of new technological forces which are in themselves ambivalent. Any, if, if you put it historically, any uh, new technology, any new technological environment have, has had uh, very ambivalent consequences uh, in, in the society, in the environment and so on. So, I would say to some degree that's normal. It's normal that some technologies uh, um, create new pressures, uh, new disparities, uh, disparities, social and cultural disparities. The, the digital divide, for example, are very important subjects and themes. Uh, and to some degree that's, that's a normal process, historically, historically um, uh, seen. Um, but it's, of course, very difficult to, to create solutions, political and uh, s social solutions for these new problems to some degree. But, uh, I mean, um, it's probably like in any modernization process. There are some groups which are on the losing side and there are groups that are on the winning side. This is something we don't like, but it's uh, almost always the case that those modernization uh, pushes um, create those uh, new divides. And this is probably the case uh, of the society we are in at the moment. Um, and this has very often been observed, that there are people who, who cannot keep pace with the changes, who cannot keep pace with, with the technological um, challenge, which uh, is uh, everywhere, of course. Uh, the second point, um, what should universities do? Um, well, I mean, I cannot deny that I'm, as an historian, I, I am, I am, I'm belonging to the uh, corporation of uh, of the humanities, <laughs> and uh, of course, we have also also a very strong tradition in this in these humanities, which I cannot completely leave behind. So I would say, um, and, and what, what what I was. Um, very often thinking during the last two or three decades was that it's fine if more money is given into the university system, which partly has been the case, or is still being the case in Germany, for example. I think it's in Netherlands a little bit compar comparable. It's fine if there is an ex it's, it's not, okay, for, sorry for that. <laughs> um, uh, it's fine if there is investment in, in education and university. We all need uh, to, to think this a positive uh, step. But uh, in my opinion, what was um, lacking was freedom. Freedom given to universities, to uh, scientific communities, uh, to set their own agenda, to uh, cap capitalize their own creativity, 
um, and that has something to do with confidence, which is given to an academic community or not. And this has something to do with functions this academic community and universities are supposed to, to fulfill. And uh, again, I would say that there are some big mistakes which have been uh, done, have been made in Europe. There was a lack of confidence and there were uh, very clear functions um, the universities uh, were supposed to fulfill. And uh, this, in, in my opinion, is wrong. So I would, the Bologna process, in my opinion, is, a, is the best example for that. It's, it's a top-down process which uh, is very bureaucratic which, uh, is, um, which comes from, from a vision, a technocratic vision, for which academics and universities are um, put in motion uh, to, to fulfill this, these visions. And this is a top-down process, and it's the contrary to academic freedom, in my opinion. This is uh, a soft power, so to speak, which, which has been lacking and is, in my opinion, still lacking in, in um, uh, university policy. Okay, next question. Um, I would like to ask you about the um, current state of the educational system and if you think we are on the right, in general, on the right track in, in Europe. Because um, I have the feeling that um, specialization begins ever earlier, starting at school, then going to a bachelor, then doing a master, then you could do a PhD or specialize otherwise. And um, I have a feeling that this is um, counterproductive for flexibility um, of the, the worker, the, the knowledge worker, as you call it. So um, are we on the right track or should we be more, I don't know how to call it, but more open in our education? Yeah. I would agree to your last point. Um, I mean, the, the early specialization is part of the strategy to, to form individuals and to educate, to train individuals for a supposed labor market for specific professional uh, proficiencies and capabilities. And uh, I mean, there are many, many examples for that. Uh, the, 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 the high school curriculum, for example, I, I mean, I, live in I happen to live in Bavaria for a long time now, and there always was a question, do we need to, to introduce uh, uh, um, information and communica communication technology into the curriculum in the, in the high school? Or do we need um, a new uh, subject of economics, for example, which, or do we need more economics at high school? Uh, and so on. So th there are many examples for that, that uh, a very early specialization uh, for market relevant um, proficiencies uh, were required, was required. And this um, continues certainly in, in the university. I mean, it's the contrary to what uh, is being done in the United States, which very often are the, the um, forebuild, what does it mean, uh, the, the, the good example. Um, in the United States, you have uh, the college where you can uh, study different uh, things uh, fairly, fairly, um, in a fairly free way. And after that, you decide where to go, where, to, where will you specialize in which, in which, um, uh, in which subject, uh, be it law, be it medicine, be it uh, speci specializing in different, different uh, subjects. So, um, this is, of course, the American uh, model, which is not necessarily the right one for Europe. But uh, what we, what we uh, try to do is to introduce a vision or a certain image of what was successful in the United States, and we combined it with European or different, in different countries with different national uh, traditions. And uh, that has, in my opinion, gone wrong. I mean, we, we should, in my opinion, we, we should have uh, stuck to the to the traditions uh, which are not so bad in many times. So, and one of this tradition is, tra is not, not to be too specialized in a too early age. Thank you. Thank you for your fascinating lecture and, and also, I must say, in a way, thought provoking. I, had, I, I was fascinated the more you talked about, about what you exactly mean by knowledge and, and this knowledge society, etc. because there are so many aspects of it. 
and you mentioned all these aspects uh, in various ways. So one aspect of knowledge is, of course, that you know things, whatever you know. And you talk about new technologies and skills related to that. That's another aspect, the skills aspect of knowledge. And um, also you talked about social engineering and, and technocracy, etc. And I realized that the more I thought about it during your talk, that a lot of knowledge is also conforming individuals to a certain pattern of living in a society. And this is the aspect which you were also discussing in a way, and that you also said it's related to the way society works, and you talk about the European system, and the European way of thinking, the European background, etc., which could have a different implication. And this also means then that you have a different knowledge in a way. So knowledge is also a lot of conforming to a societal pattern in a way. And um, if, you, if you are critical of the societal pattern, and you're saying this, these are leading us to, to, to roads which we don't like as a society, then what, what should we do? And, I wonder whether you talk, when you talked about academic freedom that you were saying that academic freedom basically um, uses the universities as a warning system that, 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 that the knowledge is going to too much in one track and that you should cultivate a certain countervailing power within your system to be critical of your own knowledge and to, to put it back to the right track. Maybe you could comment on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the, so the, the question deals mainly with, with uh, that sort of inner university strategy, if I, if I got it right, or general. Mm. Also for society. Yeah. And also, I mean, I once read a column by a very interesting columnist who said, well, listen, the government, the government knows exactly what individuals should do. Mm, yeah. And if they follow those rules that the government has in mind, which are conform to the market system, then the society would perfectly. Only these stupid individuals, they don't know it. Yeah. So they should be better educated. And if you yeah. educate them better to work for the market, then they work very well. Yeah. And the Nobel Prize has been won by showing that if an, if an individual is rational, then Pareto optimality occurs in everything. I mean, we can prove that still infinity. And, and so we can, we can have knowledge for individuals how to behave in that way, but they don't. Yeah. And this is what I meant. Yeah. I mean, uh, to some extent, it's the old debate about um, the relationship between the individual, the market, and culture, uh, which, of course, is a very old debate and uh, which is reactualized, so to speak, by, by recent developments. Um, but what you said, in, in a way, I, I feel confirmed myself by, by what you said, because uh, I would agree that um, some theoretic ideas of how individuals should behave as a rational choice agency, for example, or an homo economicus uh, who makes the rational choices on the market and lives and wants to live solely on the market, all these ideas are very common in, in these government, government uh, schemes, uh, how to cope with the crisis and how to, to develop society. But that's what I, I would wanted uh, to try to, to, um, to, make, uh, to make the point, that uh, this is um, rather, a rather um, limited view of mankind, a rather limited view of, of the individuals, and uh, if I, when I speak of European traditions, I would very strongly maybe to try to make the point that this reduction of an individual on uh, market uh, rationality is not enough. It, it's, it belongs to the European tradition to, to see more in, in human beings, more than only homine, homine, uh, homines um, economici, <laughs> um, more than uh, market individuals. And uh, this is certainly one of the reasons why these schemes are failing. I mean, you, you uh, asked at the beginning, 2010, the Lisbon strategy, was it fulfilled or was it accomplished until 2010? It was, of course, not. And the, the European governments, uh, governments and the European Commission has, uh, has, um, has accepted that it that didn't work in that way. But uh, this has its reason, because it's a sort of technocratic, uh, limited technocratic view of society and individuals, which in practice doesn't work. So that um, uh, technocratic visions on the one hand and democratic decisions and choices can really fall apart. And uh, I would say uh, uh, a far-sighted European or national uh, policy in education and society 
uh, would have uh, would have to to think to anticipate to some degree these multi uh, perspective um, dimensions of of society and individuals. This is a rather general answer, but um, perhaps we leave it at that. Could you relate it to academic freedom? Um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, academic freedom is what I said about academic freedom. Freedom uh, was directed to that question about universities, of course. I mean, in the university, I would uh, insist on on a fairly high degree of academic freedom as a necessity for progress, for scientific progress, and for for a lively uh, education system, higher education system. Um, but I wouldn't, agree, I wouldn't say that academic freedom is the, the, the key word for all problems in society, of course. It's a very limited uh, milieu where academic freedom, freedom needs, in my opinion, to be strengthened um, in universities. Well, that's a beautiful way to end, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, maybe freedom not has not only been strengthened in universities, but in uh, society as a whole. Or is it freedom or is it diversity? Mm. And autonomy. Mm. Well, that's some, some of the key elements taken back in your talk. And uh, I think uh, the issue will be I mean, I'm looking at this beautiful poster and saying, so knowledge power, I mean, you would immediately say yes if I look at an individual level. Mm. Knowledge is a power. I think the key issue is. Can we use knowledge to renew and improve society and the power of society? And to do this, you need many elements. One is academic freedom, the other one is autonomy, I completely agree with you. But you also have to invest wisely. And mm -hmm. although it's nice <coughs> for universities to get more money, I wouldn't say no. But it's, the question is how would you do with your power? Economical power, knowledge powers, with your yeah, innovation powers and how you go out and try to improve the conditions of society. You can't do that alone as, as mm -hmm. universities or as That's knowledge right. institutions. Mm -hmm. You have to do this with partners, with the government, for example, with the public sector, with the private sector. And I think that would be the key, in a way, uh, for the future. And, and you know, we can, of course, be uh, uh, yeah, depressed or optimistic about the future. I mean, one strength that Germany has, it has always reinvented itself mm. over centuries of crisis and change. And I think that gives at least hope for the future that, again, there will be a way out of this crisis. So I mean, uh, uh, so I, I think we should end this, this, this evening indeed on a positive note. And we've got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, encouragement from you. And to make it even more positive, I think I would like to first of all to thank you for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, with the, Tough competition uh, of the weather, but it was a great, thing, a great lecture in the tradition of the Schumann lectures. Yeah, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the city of Marseille, Jacques Costong, who has been here with us, and the uh, uh, city supports this lecture. It's also a nice uh, example of collaboration. I would like to thank the, the organizers of Student General who made this evening possible. And I finally, and that is the bonus for everybody, I would invite, like to invite everybody to a drink, which will be here in Art Fundum at the entrance, where we then uh, can continue our discussions in a more informal way. Thank you very much.